Are you unable to concentrate on the tasks at hand? Do you need help focusing more or leveling up your game? Here's a tip. Try Cognizant Citicoline, clinically studied to support mental energy, focus, memory, and attention. Cognizant supports brain health and supplies the brain with the energy it needs to stay sharp. Cognizant is a leading nootropic featured in over 200 products. This podcast is powered by Cognizant. Visit Cognizant.com to learn more and find a product to help you fuel your day. Ready to achieve great heights? Then you're in the right place. Welcome to Power Your Performance, the podcast where we dive deep with leaders in the gaming world and beyond and learn the techniques they use to power their lives. I am your host, Gary Kleinman. No, Faustine, welcome to Power Your Performance. Thank you very much. Glad to be here. It is actually a pleasure to have you. As uh, we were talking a couple seconds ago, uh, my interest is always in health wellness through the lens of gaming, and that's what uh, Skins, uh, the company, is all about. And your history as a game designer is just fascinating to me. Um, in, in many respects, you can look at your bio, and you're the, the guru, so to speak, of game design by not only by resume, but by history and where you have been and, and what you've accomplished. So tell me, when you were young, were you gaming? And is that why you said, I can design games? Where, where did the impetus and passion come from? Yeah, well, I've, I've certainly tried to dissect that myself out of curiosity. And I was a big game player uh, as long as I can remember, certainly since I was five or six. But uh, I'm old enough that that meant board games. And it really uh, wasn't until, let's see, I was about... 14 or 15 and had been going to the local arcade where there are all these mechanical pinball machines. And there was this wonderful white plastic um, thing with a, a TV monitor in it and a space game in it. And this was Nolan Bushnell's um, uh, computer space game that he did before he did Pong. And it turned out that it was just too complicated and expensive for the public, but it was exactly right for me. And I remember still very clearly just being so shocked by this thing that looked like it had, you know, come from 20 years or more in the future and uh, thinking, why aren't there more of these computer things? This is great. So, you know, I'd, I'd say that was kind of my my pathway, but I got into the games industry without realizing it was even an industry. This was in early 1980. So I really just thought, you know, I had people telling me this is a fad that's probably going to blow over. And they, I thought they might've been right, but I figured if it is a fad, then I want to stick with it as long as it lasts. Well, maybe, maybe you're one of the reasons that it wasn't a fad and it, and it did get some longevity. Were you also like a sci-fi fan um, oh, absolutely. Up. So you think I mean, that there's I, I, a crossover yeah. between the kind of games you liked and the world or the entertainment and the stories that engrossed you? Absolutely. I, and I think I, I share this with, I would say, 90 percent of the game designers of my generation that we grew up on fantasy and science fiction and uh it's funny i compare notes and we have a lot of the same old paperbacks you know stuck away that we couldn't um do without uh but that was a great inspiration and i went to a, a college to let me design my own curriculum and i ended up doing as my big senior project a uh, my first video game my first full-scale video game that was a uh, simulation of mining and combat in the asteroid belt uh, a little bit like actually what um, the TV show The Expanse has been doing uh, up until recently. It was that sort of a milieu. And that was, you know, that kind of science fiction, uh, Star Trek and then Star Wars were really my inspirations uh, growing up. And, you know, it's just been a pleasure to not only get to do that sort of work, but for, you know, to work with some of the people that worked on those projects and, you know, get to bring them to the interactive age. Did you find resistance? Distance as, as a young kid um, in playing games and, and having the interest in the subject matters you did, because I, I have to believe then it certainly isn't as common as it is today. 
not so much resistance in playing games. They were a way that my family came together and my brother and sister are um, 11 and nine years older than me. So uh, growing up, you know, I really looked up to them and we would play games as a family and it was really a uh, tough competition for me to you know dive in there with with people older than me but i i learned strategies and uh clearly for me you know looking back i've always had a fascination with uh, how rules work and what makes the world work the way it does and how to you know manipulate and change those rules if possible which is really the essence both of being a, a very good game player and learning how to make games and uh you know it, it does feel to me like it's partially a genetic thing I'm, I'm not quite sure but my family was very supportive of that they were happy with me you know making games my mother was one of the ones who was afraid it was a fad but i reassured her that the computer programming i'd learned would work just fine for doing boring business accounts receivable programs uh, and you know she was content that that was something i could fall back on if necessary do you remember the first time you beat your siblings playing those games I don't know about the first time, but there was a game called uh, the Flag Game of the United Nations, which uh, it's Parker Brothers or Milton Bradley and ended up working for Milton Bradley uh, in, early in my career. And it was a game that, uh, for one thing, you ended up memorizing the flags of every country in the world as part of the game. But I found a strategy of withholding certain cards and playing them out at a certain time. And I got really good and was beating my everybody else in my family until my brother and sister actually ganged up against me and cooperated to take me down. And the injustice of that uh, stuck in my memory. That was probably when I was about six or seven. Yeah, I don't think, we won't get into the uh, psychological therapy that they put you in. <laughs> right. Uh, but I, it's always interesting when when I talk to people that have siblings and 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 there's game I, I had um, a, a really robust conversation with a professional um, baseball player who grow up grew up gaming and he very rare uh, very specifically remembers the first time he, he beat his older brother to this day and and it uh, put a smile on his face were your parents kind of um, into sci-fi as well or coding or game play or creation or is it just no, you're the first in the all, family really. yeah i mean it was actually my brother who got me started on that that uh we shared a room when i was you know very young before he went off to college and he would stay up and watch uh twilight zone and outer limits and i was too young to be able to watch them but then um when we were in the bedroom uh you know with um you know, two beds in the same room there, he would sometimes uh, tell me the plot of the uh, show he had just watched, which may have been even better for me than actually seeing it because I just made up all the images in my head. And uh, that was, you know, he was definitely both in terms of playing games and certainly in science fiction and a number of other things. Uh, my love of puns, he was very influential that way. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, I... Um... You know, Rod Serling was a hero. I remember watching, even later in life, uh, I think it was Christmas. I think it's Christmas or Thanksgiving uh, when they do a Twilight Zone marathon. And I can watch the same ones over and over and over again. And uh, But it never got me into uh, creating games because a lot of the, the creation of games is you have to be very creative because it starts with a story. And so did you always have stories in your head that you were playing to yourself or, or others and then ultimately which will we will talk about then had the, the the good fortune to be able to create that um, and morph that into actual games that others can play that's an interesting question i i wouldn't say it always started with a story for me that uh as a game designer, sometimes I think about what we now call game mechanics, but even as a, a child, I had a sense that there were certain ways that would be interesting to play. Um, and often there was a story involved, but you know, sometimes it was fitting the story to uh, the mechanic. And uh, just as an example, one of the earliest um, cardboard games I remember making as a child, I was rolling uh, coins uh, down the linoleum floor, just trying to see if I could get coins to roll. And I, I found that if I made a little um, 
a sort of slot out of cardboard then and then rolled it down there they would go a lot farther and it reminded me i, I had recently seen the movie uh, sink the bismarck about the, the hunt for that that ship in world war ii and it reminded me of torpedo planes dropping a torpedo in the water and having it roll so it was the idea of rolling coins that got me started, but finding that story meant that then I made another little cardboard Bismarck ship and had it set out on the floor a few feet away and would try to roll these torpedo coins into different sections of the ship that I had given different point values to. So that's probably indicative both of how I started as a kid, realizing that it was fun to make games, but also that sometimes it's the, the mechanics that come first in the story you fit it around there or you find a story that, that works well with it. But naturally you had um, a talent, a skill and an affinity to actually create the game, which is, you know, it's one thing you, there are a lot of people that can tell a good story, but to be able to translate that as you have uh, into a game and a playable game is a, a, a true skill set. So was that natural that you you understood the mechanics um, or was that a lot of it supported by education? Where, Where do you learn that actual, you know, tactile skill to build that out? You know, it's a really good question. And I think at least what you're getting at is, I you know, I think it's it's. Uh, more of a, a, a nature thing, you know, that uh, I, not that you're born to be a game designer necessarily, but certainly people that have that kind of skill are drawn to games as, as one of the main things they do. It also has a lot of people in the sciences because wanting to know how something works and figure out those rules is very common to scientists as well. It's just that with games, you get to actually change the rules and figure out how to optimize them. Uh, but, you know, those, those two disciplines, I think, are fairly close. And certainly I found over and over again that uh, I've worked with a lot of science, scientists in totally different fields, and many of them are game players. And uh, often we end up exchanging stories about how we thought about the other's jobs and how it would be fun. I did something at NASA, a simulation of the International Space Station, and we had a wonderful uh, evening where we were comparing notes with them talking about wanting to make video games and us talking about wanting to be at NASA when we were kids. Well, yeah, which which is great. I mean, the, the foundation is such, and, and I give you a lot of credit and your family credit that you had this natural ability and talent and most and most certainly your desire. And, and they actually supported that so that you could do that for your life. I know there are so many other people say, well, yeah, I couldn't. I had to go to law school or med school or be, you know, go to the family business. So that is incredibly cool. Um, but when you got your first job in, in terms of creation and you know, other creating games, were they your ideas or did it work as you're, you're at Lucas and they go, we, we need to do this type game, this type story, but you need to create the game? Well, it's been a mix over my career. And my very first job was at Milton Bradley, as I mentioned. Mm-hmm. And uh, when I was hired there, right, literally right out of college, I started, I think, two or three days after my graduation. Uh, they had their own projects that they wanted me, that they assigned me to. In fact, I was working not directly on a game, but on speech recognition software for a uh, toy that Milton Bradley was working on. And It wasn't too long before, uh, though, I had that opportunity to come up with games from scratch that at Milton Bradley, we reverse engineered the uh, Atari VCS, sometimes also called the 2600, one of the very first game consoles that was out there, one of the most successful early ones. And uh, none of the people who had been in the company for a long time really had any concept of what these new video games were were about so this group of us who are all in our you know earlier mid-20s were basically coming up with concepts ourselves and you know given a lot of free reign to to fit them in um but in general i would say oh i don't know at least 80 to 90 percent of the work that i've done in games has been with some fairly serious constraints either someone else's story um in some cases making a game based on a movie uh in other cases 
people would come to me as a freelancer with a project that they needed a game for uh, most recently in, in the health area. And I'm, I'm sure we'll talk about that. But yes. they often have a quality they want the game to have, but they don't really know what the game should be. So there's often you know, a large degree of originality that I get to put in it. But it's extremely rare that I've basically been able to sort of start from scratch and make whatever type of game I want. It, and how important as you're developing a game is, is it in your head about music and art that's going to be equally important in the development? Or are you looking at it more from just the physical mechanics of the build? Well, I try to look at the interactivity first. Um, uh, Chris Crawford, uh, you know, a very early uh, game designer, video game designer, uh, always talks about um, verbs, not nouns. You, you want to uh, think about the ways that players are interacting, the choices that they can make. Uh, and to quote another game designer, uh, make, give them a series of interesting choices to make. And that's really at the heart of it. But it, it's, it's impossible to do that in a vacuum. So I will think about not necessarily the music per se, although some designers think about that right away, but uh, certainly the visuals and certainly as a, a former programmer, I haven't done any serious coding in many years, but I always think about what the um, computer or console or you know whatever system you're using is capable of. And what I find really exciting is to look at the constraints that, that there always are many constraints, you know, either, as I say, a story or a, uh, a framework that I'm given the technology that the, the game is going to, to run on the audience that you have, the stakeholders. Uh, sometimes you make a game for to be played by one person, but you're actually trying to sell it to their parents. And in fact, to get their parents interested in, you need to have other people who might uh, promote it to them, a, a teacher or a doctor, for example. So it can get very complicated trying to sort out all these different influences. Right. And who, in general, who are the stakeholders I, and, the, and the gatekeepers? Yeah, exactly. In, in terms of getting the games made, too, that you need to be a bit of a diplomat and make sure that whoever's putting up the money supports you and is willing to put in a little bit more if, if it's necessary. Um, but as, as to your question, I, you know, I love working with artists, really good programmers, uh, sound effects and musician people, um, testers. And there's a, it's a very collaborative experience. You know, the, the first games I made were one person shows, but uh, almost all of my professional career, I've worked with teams of people and I love the way that we challenge each other and each can end up doing something better as a group than we ever would have been able to do individually. Well, I, you know, I, I certainly would hope so because gaming at its core is, is communal engagement, right? Or multiple engagement. So I would think that the, the methodology to create the games would be based in that as well. Um, and, and that's gotta be fun from a work perspective to work with incredibly credible creative teams that certainly understand the science and the mechanism, but understand, understand story and conflict and conflict resolution and art and history and music. I mean, it, it, it's kind of like an entire curriculum rolled into one. Absolutely. You know, uh, was there a lot of different uh, perspectives in each of the, the organizations you worked for, whether it was Lucas or DreamWorks and uh, even at, at Google? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, uh, there are company cultures. Uh, that's been an interesting thing that I, I kind of took it for granted early in my career. And the more experienced I've become, the more aware of how a company culture shapes um, creativity and direction. Uh, one of the things I find interesting is that having had the privilege of working in the very early days at Lucasfilm Games, we were actually part of a computer division of Lucasfilm early on. And the biggest chunk of people in the computer division was the graphics group that was what became spun off to be Pixar. So a lot of the folks at Pixar, are, you know, at least on the founding level, are people that I knew and that I worked with. And I've seen how the uh, George Lucas and the company culture that he created 
going back to American graffiti, I believe, um, really pervaded the way all of us at Lucasfilm thought and very much affected Pixar. And I've since worked with people who trained at Pixar but were never part of Lucasfilm and they've started companies. And those companies, you can it's really a family tree. You can see how they encourage creativity in the same ways. Uh, in some cases, even have the same sorts of structure of buildings to have, um, to your point, meeting places where it's very easy to bump into other creative people uh, accidentally and be able to just have conversations that come up out of nowhere. That something that I've learned is really critical and uh, unfortunately is very difficult to come by in today's you know COVID isolated age. Yeah, but I, I would I am, think so. Uh, and, well, and, and I'm looking forward to getting back in 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 person meetings. I've had a few in the last few months. There's nothing better, uh, man, and and probably ultimately a blend of some remote and 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 some together. But I guess one of the other things, and again, I have no, you know, you, you kind of lose me at all control delete when it comes to technology, um, is the the ease of or and, and ease may not be the proper word of the creating a game that the tools today um are so much uh more responsive and probably even more intuitive so when you started the you've seen that that journey of technology making it easier to create a game is it yeah very very strongly i mean I, the, some of those 2600 games i did at milton bradley um and none of which were ever published by the way it's a, a long story but uh they gave up on on getting into that area because they were they were too nervous about the cost of electronic games um but it would take us two or three months to really get something interesting happening on the screen because you essentially had to build an operating system from scratch. And we had um, the cartridges on those things held uh, 2048 or 4096 bytes of data. And that was the computer program, any kind of graphics, sound, it, which is just a laughable amount. You know, it's, it's the equivalent of several tweets at this point of data. <laughs> um, and... Uh, today, uh, with game jams where people create entire games in, you know, a weekend or 24-hour period, um, it's just it floors me. Uh, now I'll just pass on one of my my favorite anecdotes about that happened two years ago when I was working um, as a mentor at a an indie uh, game accelerator that Google runs, and I was doing a brainstorming technique, teaching a brainstorming technique that I, I learned from a science fiction writer, where we come up with an idea for a game, just almost like an improv comedy where I'm getting suggestions from the audience and I'm shaping that into an idea. And the idea for this game was for a um, uh, lovesick um, uh, cockroach, I think it was, uh, who falls in love with the worm at the bottom of a tequila bottle, or I guess a mezcal bottle, and goes on an expedition into this this mezcal bottle to to rescue his 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 the love of his life and you know we're having fun coming up with this the whole idea of it to, is to do something that's really original and unusual and you know we were enjoying that and there was one of the the many teams that were there who were very attentive at first but then got very animated with each other and were talking and typing furiously and i didn't think anything of it because they were all responsible for doing their own work but at the end of the hour i was answering questions and these two guys came up to me a few minutes after the class ended and they said, you stole our idea. And I said, what do you mean? You know, as we just brought it up as, as we were there and they had actually mocked up a functioning version of the game that we described oh my gosh. literally as we were talking about it. And it, it, you know, it was ugly. It was very simple. But you could actually go down this little bottle and they had sharks swimming in the bottle like we had talked about and you had to avoid the sharks. And if you got to the little worm at the bottom, hearts came up and, you know, that was I mean, it was very simple, but it was just amazing to me that they did that. You know, I think they started on it probably uh, half an hour before they brought it to me and showed it to me. And it, they even had a little you know score on the, the screen at the end of the game. So, uh, yeah, the tools have become you know orders of magnitude better and faster it's just amazing so yeah i guess what pops into my mind when you say that is is that a good thing does does it 
almost empowered too many people to create a game. And then the clutter of games that go into the marketplace uh, make it that much more difficult for a good game, if you will, to rise to the top and, and, and find an audience. Oh, I, I wouldn't say so at all. I mean, I think uh, you're certainly correct that the number of games people try to publish now is just also orders of magnitude higher. But the complexity and the uh, bar that you're aiming at also goes up as the quality of the tools goes up. And this is true of you know every art form. You, you look at the the early silent movies and they're really you know most of them are pretty hard to watch now because they're they're so primitive not so much from the technology but just because of what people have learned subsequently about cinematic storytelling and it's very hard to make movies very expensive to make movies but they're more being made today than there ever were before and uh in general i think the quality is is higher you know maybe not the average quality but the very best ones are amazing and that's true of games as well so i think it you know just as the tools get better as it gets possible to do more it just requires a higher level of quality to capture people's attention and it's hard for the creators that way i I feel very lucky to have been involved when it was relatively easy to make games and get them out there but you know the price we paid is that the the technology was uh you know, uh, bear skins and stone knives compared to what we're using now. Oh, yeah. Uh, there, there, there's no question. Uh, when did you leave Google? I mean, how long has it been? Well, I was at Google for four years from, let's see, 2013 to 2017. So it's been about five years now. And, and then you started your consultancy after that? Is that? No, I actually did the consultancy since 1996. But I stopped because the offer to work full time at Google was just too good to pass up. So I basically kind of froze my company and thought it out uh, when it was time to leave Google. I, I was not able to work on the kinds of games that I wanted to. And in fact, the, the job I'd been hired for uh, at kind of ceased to exist almost before I was able to start working on it. So, you know, company politics and big companies uh, with, with a huge number of projects. So it's a fascinating place to work. But I wanted to go back to my freelance work, both because it was less stressful and uh, because I really wanted to make a lot of games. And Google was pushing more, more and more into helping organize um events to help game developers make games for their hardware, which was not really my area of expertise. So now we get to talk about the real fun stuff, neuroscience, neurogaming, health, wellness, nutrition, and gaming. What do you recall being your first trigger or thought that said this is important to you? Well, the first game that really influenced me was, uh, a game I had a very small role on. I was called Remission, and it came out in I think 2002, 2003. I remember very clearly we had our first meeting for it um, on. Uh, it was uh, September 12th, uh, 2001, and uh, you know, it got canceled because of the events yes. of September 11th that day. <laughs> um, but. Uh, That was sponsored by the wife of the man who started eBay um, and the wealth that uh, the Omidyars who who founded eBay had was, you know, being put to a lot of philanthropic uses. And one of them was um, this company called uh, Hope Lab. And uh, Pam Omidyar wanted to make games to help with children's health and was not a gamer herself. So, you know, ended up bringing in a lot of people and, you know, it was a very interesting organization. The game itself was to help uh, teenagers who had had leukemia and had been on, you know, through radiation and were now in chemotherapy. A significant percentage of them were just lying about taking their chemotherapy pills because it made them nauseous and they didn't like it and they were teenagers. So they, they figured after they'd been through the radiation, they were feeling pretty good now and they didn't really need the pills. 
But of course, they really did, and and it was hard to convince them. And the game, surprisingly, even with a big double-blind randomized controlled trial to make sure that this was not a a spurious result, it actually made a big difference in their uh, habits and their um, uh, adherence to taking these pills. And that was a game changer, no pun intended there for me, <laughs> just just to realize that I could work on games that could literally save lives. Um, and particularly, I think around that time, the turn of the, the millennium, there was a lot of press then about games being all violent and all terrible and ruining the kids of America and, you know, the, the vilification that, you know, went through a little peak around then and then got completely discredited by, you know, many, many studies. Uh, but at the time, it felt really good when people said, oh, you make video games? Aren't those terrible? Aren't they ruining the lives of children? Well, I've said, you know, it's saving the lives of some kids with cancer, but, you know, I think that's a pretty good cause. So it was uh, very nice to be um, able able to to no, no, that's counter fantastic. those arguments and so you, you continue to, to to want to do that after having that kind of uh success and seeing the impact import or impact um that gaming can have in a health uh setting Absolutely. And also because I've always been fascinated by how the brain works and a lot of these games, even if they're not about neuroscience per se, uh, understanding how the mind of the player works is something that game designers are always fascinated about. You know, a lot of us have a strong interest in psychology as well as uh, sciences involving things like um, fMRI and EEG and understanding the the function of the different parts of the brain. So that was a very natural fit for me in that there's a nice synergy between uh, researchers in neuroscience who have often very boring tasks they want people to do over and over uh, in order to be able to measure things. And they find games as an incredibly, um, you know, effective way to keep people engaged and to get them interested in doing precisely the kinds of things you want to do. And we as game designers, in return, learn a great deal from these neuroscientists about how to make our games more compelling, what it is that it really means, uh, you know, what we're we're, um, doing inside people's brains as they're in the process of playing a game and what kind of keeps them interested, you know, what sort of, um, you know, dopamine or other types of uh, neurotransmitters are being released as you play. Yeah, so it's got to be fascinating for you as you sit down and work on the, these projects that that gaming um, has the ability to help improve speech or to help PTSD and, and rage issues and all the other things that I've read about that when I read, I go, well, how is that possible that a game can actually do that? Um, so how do you, as a game developer, you you're not a neuroscientist per se or trained in that way how do you take that science and integrate it into actually development mechanically well that's that's really the heart of what fascinates me about all of this you know as i've said i've been a a science nerd and you know even my science fiction interest was uh you know in, in part driven by wonder at, at, you know, the space age and, you know, the the stuff of my childhood that way. Um, and it also fits into what I said about the pleasure of working with a team of really qualified people. When you're doing serious games, which is, you know, one of the many not great names for what it is that I, I tend to do, but uh, you end up working with subject matter experts in all sorts of fields. Uh, certainly, most recently, it's been in medicine and neuroscience, but I've also worked with uh, economists, with um, nutritionists, with NASA scientists and, and rocket scientists, you know, just a whole range of people. Um, and essentially, it's, it's everything is a custom job that, that we're still at a point where there are um, a few rules. It, it reminds me, in fact, of the entire games industry back in the early or 80s or, or you know, uh, up to 1990 or so, where we really weren't quite sure 
how to do what we were doing, but we were seeing really good results. So we kept pushing it forward. Things are more informed now than they were at that point. And of course, working with medicine, you're you're uh, under a lot of constraints to be much more careful with the kinds of games that you produce and the effects that they have. But the principles are very much the same. And as you say, it's quite amazing the, the range of what games are being discovered and being able to affect, you know, in addition to what you mentioned, uh, uh, dealing with trauma, dealing with depression, uh, helping people with um, degenerative diseases like Parkinson's or Alzheimer's, uh, helping people on the uh, autism spectrum. Uh, and in fact, one of my current clients is has a game that they believe can help mediate uh, myopia, nearsightedness. Wow. And children can play this VR game uh, for uh, a few minutes a day for a long period of a couple of years. And the initial results suggest that if all works out, there, there's still a lot of testing to do. This can actually diminish their need for glasses or maybe even eliminate it in many cases. And I just find it Oh, mind-boggling and wonderful that we can make a game that does that sort of thing. Oh, what a joy for you to participate and and have a helping hand in in helping anybody with whatever their their conditions happen to be. Oh, are there areas that that you find are are more apt to being beneficial? Oh. In terms of games and health, is is it the the neuro side uh, that games? can can support versus more physical well it it actually I, it's interesting there's there's a very wide range uh, several of the companies i've worked with uh, including um, one of my current clients use games for physical therapy so it, even their games can you know do quite a bit you know in this case if you're recovering from an injury you end up having to do a bunch of repetitive uh, moves and and the this particular startup i'm working with is using augmented reality you you um set up a phone uh, in front of you and you hold your hand up and by doing various gestures with your hand, you play a game, but those gestures were selected and prescribed essentially by a physical therapist. And it's the kind of boring stuff people hate having to do. And it can be kind of painful to get over arthritis or other injury problems. But with the game, one of the things that happens is if you're really involved in a game, you don't notice the pain, or at least your your brain and your attention is so focused on the gameplay that it's no longer uh, this overwhelming, de de debilitating problem to have some pain involved. Uh, another client is working on pure pain remediation through gameplay and a similar idea. And yes, yeah, so neuroscience, things that are addressable by training your brain and by people actually changing the way they think are probably the most amenable to games. Um, that's why there are a lot of games for anxiety relief and relaxation and meditation and, uh, you know, PTSD, so all of those things, or, or uh, phobia treatment, all of those things involve uh, neurological changes that you can actually do voluntarily and have traditionally been done with a therapist, but it scales much better to have everybody's phone or computer being able to do this instead of having to set up appointments with a limited number of professionals. And then I, with, the, with the growth and, and certainly the improvement in um, AI and, and VR, that's got to be a, in another important layer in the game development. So how do you get yourself to be not an expert per se, but competent in looking at AI and VR and incorporating that technology into what the creation of a game, the way that you've been doing it your whole career? Well, I mean, this goes full circle to our talk about, you know, sort of the personality of a game designer and, uh, you know, thinking, you know, fascination on how things work. It's meant that all of my life, all of my career, certainly, I have loved learning about new technologies, uh, new concepts, new you know studies that are being done. And I find it just a pleasure. I mean, I, I, I would do this, you know, even if I had some completely different career, I'm sure I would continue to learn about all these sorts of things. But I've been incredibly fortunate to be in a career where that not only is sort of required of me, but people bring me these wonderful new technologies and I get a chance to, to play with things. You know, in 2013, I wore Google Glass for uh, about a year and 
despite all of the negative press that that, that got, uh, I became a believer in head-mounted AR and can't wait to see what Apple's been working on. Uh, I, I really expect that in another few years, it may be very common for um, some types of smart glasses to uh, not just supplement, but to start replacing our phones as one of the main, uh, you know, sort of bulwarks of our, our technology. Yeah. So as I listen to you, I, I, I'm not so sure you're a game designer, but you're as much of a futurist as you are anything else. Um, do you have thoughts of saying, I think we can accomplish something whatever that something is and then you get to go back and and use your skill set within the the confines of a game and and bring that to fruition uh yeah sometimes i do and and you bring up a good point there are a lot of game designers i would say the majority who rather than wanting to push the limits of what can be done they just want to make another game like their favorite current game but just have more stuff in it you know better graphics, you know, more enemies, bigger guns. And that is actually a very, you know, core lucrative part of the industry. Um, and, you know, there's nothing wrong with that. I love playing a lot of those games. I'm just not personally as intrigued. I, I've always been lucky uh, to, well, first very lucky and then through choice, the chosen companies that were interested in pushing those those boundaries and coming up not just with better versions of games that have been done, but really new types of games. And now in this field with new applications that sometimes aren't even games, but simply use something like VR or AI uh, to do something totally different. But those of us from the games industry are the ones that know how to use a lot of those technologies. So we're being brought into them uh, in, in that way. And yes, yeah, sometimes, uh, I mean, I haven't ever really set out to uh, solve some problem in the world on my own and rallied people together to build it. Um, but that's partly because I just enjoy working on other people's projects. And it's just, I, I don't like the, um, the huge hassles, particularly the whole money raising and organizational aspect of starting your own company. I, yeah. I dabbled in a little bit of it and realized it just was not for me. Now you spend more time on the business of the business than what you started the business for. So it, it, exactly. <laughs> it gets to be an intrusion. No, I, I love, you know, organizations like games for change that really look at games and, and the social impact that games can um, re really help achieve um, maybe not a solution, but, but positive growth and an impact for individuals and groups. And I've always been fascinated by how games are, are no longer just entertaining, even though they are, but you take businesses that train management on games by creating an avatar in a game and they have to reach certain excellence and move on to another level to get into it, you know, a first Further deeper management program. And I think it's fascinating. And everything I have read in terms of what, not specifically what you're doing, what games can do uh, for uh, health and wellness is just fascinating. I commend you for that. Um, I've got 50,000 other questions, but I said it would be a half hour and we're about there. So Noah, thank you so much for your time. Um, I will be following hopefully some of these things. There, There's just so many uh, applications for the use of games in health and wellness, and I'm glad there are folks like you that are taking that charge. Well, thank you very much. It's been a great pleasure. I well, appreciate it. You stay well, and uh, now you can go game. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, Thanks, Noah. Be well. Have a good day. All right. Thanks for listening. This podcast is part of the MAP Esports Podcast Network and produced by Innovation Media Enterprises. Please be sure to leave us a review and follow us on your favorite podcast player.